marketeers would suggest that there's many ways to carve up a market and segment it. The one that you should use is the one that gives you greatest insight for your purposes. There is no one right way. You probably have to do it a couple different ways to gain that insight. But you ought to be able to look, be able to look at your customers in one sense and understand how does that line up with your training products? Who is this product for? What were their real needs? And if you don't do that, basically, your customers will drive you out of business because they'll go elsewhere. And whether that's them clamoring for you to get reduced funding in the future, so funding can go someplace else where somebody else can take better care of their needs, or they just have you shut down. When I was at Motorola, I was there at the start of what's now M-Tech. They hadn't had corporate training in 10 years because corporate training didn't work for the corporation. And they decentralized it all. And that didn't work either. So then they centralized it all. And now they've got both. Your training system needs to be somewhat modular, we think, because you need to meet the needs of a diverse marketplace. You might have various jobs, red jobs, blue jobs, green jobs, etc., And you have a bunch of modules, sub-assemblies of your products, some of which are needed by your customer. When I buy a car, I've got CDs now. I don't buy a car with a cassette tape player. I buy one with, the, with CDs. Somebody else might want to still buy the one with a cassette. How does that manufacturer build a flexible product, reducing their costs as they do that to meet the needs of the marketplace, which do differ? But I still need brakes. So do you. And Ford Motor Company and General Motors do not put a different brake system on each and every car that they have. They have got maybe 17 brakes for 87 different kinds of cars. That reduces their cost to be in business. These multiple training modules, that's our title for the sub-assembly modules, must be available for custom configuration and training events. You can have standard training events, your standard deliverable, and ways to do it custom. Take it apart at the module level and reconfigure to meet a specific customer's need. That, again, provides you with some flexibility in meeting those needs. Training products must be updated easily. We know that there is going to be continuous change. That is the only guarantee that we have. So if we can anticipate that, how do we get our act together so that we can better deal with it as it comes and hits us day after day, quarter after quarter? <clears throat> a training curriculum that's merely a collection of courses <clears throat> probably isn't going to have a lot of return on investment. It may not just be nil, it may be negative. And your shareholders of the corporation do not want you to be squandering the resources on just training stuff. It's there for a reason. It's a business reason. Okay, this concept of a curriculum architecture is simply the entire system of training that could be understood in an event product level and the sub-assembly level with an understanding of all the target audiences. <coughs> There's, and what we have here on the left is a way to organize the inventory of all the modules. It's not how the product looked. It's simply if you were to go into the factory or the training factory here and, and look around, you'd be, it'd be the equivalent of looking for all the electrical things and all the fuel delivery systems things and all the brake systems things, and all the sheet metal. This is a way to organize your understanding of all the training piece parts. Hopefully so you can divide it up for all the training resources to participate in creating and updating and delivering. There's got to be some central control here that says here's what the whole product line looks like. It's the only reason that somebody like Ford can have component plants where they make components, ship them to assembly plants and make them and they actually all fit together or they do better nowadays. They didn't do so well before. Job number one, that's the first car off the assembly line. It's supposed to be done with quality. It used to be used to determine, so what's wrong with this one and how do we go fix it and go back up the entire line and fix everything back. <clears throat> no, the concept now, which was a radical concept, was that by the time that first one rolled off the line, it was very good. It had quality. And that was the driver. Well, the performance based CAD organizes all your training into structures, in this, and it's got some logic behind it. It understands the target audience. It understands management's prioritization. If we can identify 5,000 chunks of training here, some one of them has to be priority number 5,000. Let's hope no one ever builds that one. That may be the easiest one to build, may have the less contentiousness with the customers. It's probably time management or something like that. However, time management applied to R&D organizations or sales organizations or a business manager or somebody else is probably very a different application. Those concepts and theories may be a chunk of what's needed, but probably what I need as a learner is 
what do I do with that? How do I apply this to my world? Great concepts, but what do I do with that? Well, we need to have those kinds of things in there also. So I might have a supporting knowledge and skills <coughs> module, if you will, of time management, and down here it teaches me how to do something with that. Because there's probably some master performers somewhere in the system that have already figured that out. Why don't we steal benchmark from them and train me on their shortcuts, their tricks of the trade. <coughs> so that's one of the things that a CAD can do for you. It'll take those generic knowledge and skills, like presentation skills, and teach you how to do something real with it per your job, if that's a priority. If it's not a priority, then we don't do that either. <coughs> One experience I had with presentation skills that I think is interesting is that we worked with a client and they wanted a three week long presentation skills course. We said, gee, you know, you can buy those. They're about, you know, one to three days, five days at the most. We're presenting to Congress. It was NASA. <coughs> that's a different presentation skill set. <laughs> yes, Senator. And then the truth spews forth, you know. Um, and that mo training module is matched to a performance model that said, yeah, we're presenting to Congress. Okay, so we do need presentation skills, but it's not the same thing as we might have thought otherwise. And it was definitely a need to know versus a nice to know. We could prove that to ourselves because we had a performance model of what this performer was doing, what they're on the payroll to do. Training modules can be reconfigured into various training events for specific needs. Again, if a company bus at the picnic rolls over and the entire department is lost for two weeks or two months because they're in the hospital, we need to bring in some temporaries or people from around the organization and train them up to do the job because the job goes on. <clears throat> How do we deal with something like that? Well, we may be able to take apart existing training real quickly and customize a delivery for those temps. We've got to make sure that no training module or event is developed or purchased that doesn't par become part of the integral whole. How does it fit? How does it fit now in the, in the, when it's first introduced? Maybe very different than how it's integrated later on. If you're going to focus on something like diversity training right now, you've got to take diverse, something like diversity training and make a big deal about it. You've got to make a political statement with something like that. We've, I've been dealing with clients on this for a long time. So you will do things like that getting ready for Workforce 2000. But so you can put it on a pedestal and have it be a standalone course, and I've heard training folks complain about this, but we don't teach anybody what to really do with it. Yeah, that's because you haven't figured out yet what to do with it and where it really applies. But it's a great, it is a concept, it's part of the future, you put something like that out there, then you take that course apart at some point in the future and you integrate where you use your diversity sensitivity and the diversity things <coughs> in the real world, like in hiring, performance appraisal, and things like that. There are applications for those things and probably many more. But right now it's such a political hot button that it's one of those things you don't want to touch. So just build your diversity course, put it out there. Understand how you might take it apart later on and integrate it piece part into other things. If you figure that out today before you build the course, you'll have less costs when you make that change. <clears throat> Training events may be better sequenced so that employees learn the most important skills first. Over here is a, is a representation of a curriculum path. It's got the courses, the training events on there. Some of you may be familiar with Spartan Spores. They just re-engineered for a pr price tag of $72 million for a promise of $550 million. Somebody forgot to calculate the training costs into that investment. So the return $550 was going to be held hostage to an unknown training investment. It'll take the $72 up higher. How high, they didn't know. So we did a curriculum architecture on the entire company in the midst of re-engineering. So that meant every module spec, every training event spec is probably not quite right because the re-engineering dust hadn't settled yet. The total price tag for all their training to support re-engineering was $10 million. The high priority stuff was only $3 million. So for $3 million, they could assure that the processes basically would work because people would be trained how to operate in the new processes. And so the investment now was not 72, but 75 for the promise of 550. This path on the left there basically has a phase one, phase two, phase three, you can call them anything you want, and that's all kind of arbitrary. There's a lot of arbitrary decisions in something like this, and we will make those too. But phase one is basically survival skills training, that's the concept. So we basically build a path. We don't show somebody a course catalog. We've excerpt all the things relative to their job. We down it and put it on a path so they don't have to look at all the other stuff for all the other target audiences, which is just confusing because it's organized by alpha or something else. This is organized by what they might want to consider first. 
and what they might want to consider second and then third in planning training for an individual because we know something about the job because we model the performance, we derive the knowledge and skills, we understand what we think that they need. But that individual is, comes to the job with, with different knowledges and experiences and they're not all the same. So this path just starts the planning process. It isn't what they will do, it's what we think that they should consider in what sequence. However, if they've got a project coming up next week and they, they need skills for this right now, for everybody, you train on this right now. You won't wait until you come through the cycle. So we're not imposing something on, we're giving a tool to help somebody plan training better. And so this allows the supervisor or team leader or team or individual all by them lonesome here to kind of plan their training and decide what is it they need in order to help them do the job. And if they come up with too long a list here, they should be able to prioritize that down to what's really critical because we can't afford everything that we need. We've got to only deal with the critical stuff. <clears throat> so that if em employees learn the most important skills first, they should perform better. Training produces focus and measurable but improvements in on-the-job performance. That's what this is all about. And how do you make that happen? How do you make your product line be effective? 